Egypt, the timeless land of the pharaohs, was born amidst the sands of the Sahara. Builders of temples and pyramids and inventors of hieroglyphics, the ancient Egyptians established their dominion by plying the Nile. Running the length of the kingdom from north to south, the Nile River, with its legendary floodwaters, was the main thoroughfare for transporting goods, people, and even the gods who were paraded in sacred vessels during religious festivals. Oddly enough, however, while the remains of river boats have been found, nothing has ever been discovered to indicate that the Egyptians also sailed the sea. Or perhaps just one thing. At Luxor, in the temple of Deir el-Bari, a bas-relief has been found that describes the voyage of a fleet of five ships sent by the pharaoh Hatshepsut to the mythic and faraway land of Punt, from whence they returned laden with fabulous riches. Ever since it was discovered, this bas-relief has kept archaeologists wondering. Did this journey actually take place? Why would the pharaoh Hatshepsut have commissioned this expedition? At Mursa Gawasis, on the Red Sea coast of Egypt, some recent archaeological discoveries have revived the debate over the possible reality of Hatshepsut seafaring expeditions. I thought it would be broken, but it's complete. So it's very unique, but so we found it in shape. an area where there was much domestic activity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was associated bones. with a fire pit, mm -hmm. actually with bones and, and the, so definitely domestic or even, let's say, culinary activities. Right. The pottery and ceramic objects excavated on this site lead the archaeologists to think that this spot was used as a bivouac. Could it be a base camp for seafaring expeditions to Punt, that mythical land whose existence has never been proved? Buried in the sand, a set of wooden boxes provides them with the first clue. The first time I saw these boxes, I was, I was truly astonished. Um, we had no idea that, there, that anything like this existed or would be here still after 3,800 years. we found an inscription on one of the boxes that in translation said the wonderful things of Punt. So that could not be a better answer to what they were used for. Did the ancient seafarers set out for Punt from this bay, which has since dried up? Could they have left other traces of their presence? In a cave hewn into the coral terrace, Cheryl Ward, an archaeologist who specializes in ancient boats, will make a spine-tingling discovery. Dozens of coiled ropes, left in the caves by ancient seafarers nearly 4,000 years ago. I think there were several of us who had tears come to our eyes the first time we saw this. It was so incredible, so unbelievable. We are all as amazed, I think, as Howard Carter must have been when he saw the treasures of Tutankhamun. The sense of the ancient Egyptians was so present. They left it here. 
we were the first to see it in 4,000 years. But the most precious find of all is a piece of wood whose shape is very distinctive and reminds her of the form of Hatshepsut's boats. Which part of the boat is this one? This is from the punt reliefs, of course. And what we see is this is a plank that can oh. fit exactly yeah, here. Yeah. And it touches here on the center strike. <laughs> Several dozen pieces belonging to boats will be unearthed over the course of the excavation season and treated as delicately as if they were mummies. Okay. So this way, yeah, to the, to the other cave. So seagoing vessels apparently set out from these shores for the mysterious land of Punt. Why would the pharaoh Hatshepsut have decided to launch such an expedition? Before she became pharaoh, Hatshepsut was a young princess of Egypt. As the oldest daughter of King Tutmos I and Queen Amos, she was waiting for a husband to be chosen for her. To preserve the royal bloodline, her father decided to marry her to her half-brother, Tutmos II, who inherited the throne soon afterwards. Not long after his coronation, Tutmos II fell ill and died. The young queen Hatshepsut was now a widow with a son named Tutmos III, whom her husband had had by a lesser wife. Tutmos III was only four years old. Hatshepsut thus became regent and took over the reins of the country. But she was a woman, and she would have to impose her rule. Under such conditions, how could she establish her power? The discoveries made at Mursa Gawazis rekindled the controversy over the seafaring capacities of the Egyptians. Cheryl Ward is faced with the skepticism of some of her fellow researchers who think that the latest finds are not clearly dated or sufficient enough to prove anything. They continue to believe that the expedition to Punt was an imaginary journey. So what kind of evidence can she provide that will have scientific value? In Cheryl's opinion, the only solution is to reconstruct one of the boats in Hatshepsut's fleet based on the archaeological finds from Mersa Gawazis in order to see whether the boat will be seaworthy. And a whole range of tools and some very good shipwrights. Okay, right. Uh, to carry out her project, Cheryl decides well. to team up with Tom Vosmer, a shipbuilder who was also an archaeologist. No. No. We probably need two sails then. Okay. Tom, who lives in the Middle East, has supervised the construction of several replicas of ancient sailing vessels. He and Cheryl join forces in the search for Hatshepsut's long lost seafarers.
can they recreate a ship when practically no evidence of it exists? At the moment, all the two researchers have are the dimensions of a few planks. This is absolutely amazing, isn't it? It's stunning. It's just stunning. The detail is it's so precise. These are seagoing ships. They're great seagoing ships. They're huge. They are work ships. They have people who are rowing, people who are sailing. They have the uh, cargoes piled up. As soon as they land, they begin to unload. They are a um, veritable uh, treasure house of information about the seafaring. And there's a lot of perhaps confusing things as well that um, we haven't quite sorted out what they're trying to depict exactly. And I think we'll get to that when we start building models and um, have the actual things in front of us and we can then we can sort out what those images are actually telling us in some cases where it's a, a bit of a mystery. But if we can get some of the basic measurements down, that'll help mm -hmm. a lot too. Just because they seem to be proportional. Of course, with art, that's always a question, but... 1.2 for the These bas reliefs are the only images available to the researchers, but they are incomplete. They only show the boat from one side. Just checking to see if. A few months ago in Mersagawazi's, Cheryl found some wooden planks and a rudder whose shape is identical to the one on Hatshepsut's boats. You want the blade? Moreover, knowing that the ancient Egyptians averaged about 1 meter 65 centimeters in height, enables Cheryl and Tom to observe that the bas-relief has in fact been drawn to scale, and thus to calculate the overall length of the ancient ship. 20 meters. Hatshepsut's boats must have measured a little over 20 meters. Hatshepsut knew that to accede to the rank of pharaoh, she must undergo a spectacular metamorphosis. She must appear to her subjects to be a genuine monarch, forever relinquish the attributes of femininity, don the short kilt worn by kings, take up the false beard, and wear the crown of the pharaohs. Hatshepsut knew that the success of her reign would also depend on the relationship she established with the powerful priests of Egypt. An expedition to the land of Punt would enable her to bring back large quantities of myrrh, a rare and highly prized incense that the temples and priests use daily in their ceremonies. from the gods. She ordered her royal steward Senenmut to start building five big ships outfitted with sails. Thirty-five hundred years later, Cheryl and Tom are embarking on a new phase of their investigation. At the base of the Cheops Pyramid, under a protective structure, lies a 43-meter-long boat. And I think that really ours is going to look a lot like this mm -hmm. in terms of the general hull shape. I mean, this is a huge boat. Yeah. In a lot of ways, this monumental vessel this used to transport the mummy of the pharaoh sailed the Nile more than a thousand years before Hatshepsut's reign. 
but in some ways it's Cheryl cool. is intrigued by its keel. It looks so much like the punt reliefs where you've got that nice mm. uh, little that profile. Yeah. Now these are common, I think, in boats that have to be beached or that are operating oh, right, in right. areas yeah. where they may have reefs or uh -huh. other sand areas. Because if you've got an ordinary keel dropping down there mm. like a lot of modern sailboats mm -hmm. do, mm. that keel is going to get caught on right, anything right. Yeah. that goes by. Yeah. The two researchers continue their investigation at the Cairo Museum. The boat models on display give them an idea of the shape of the hulls and the earliest sails used in ancient times. On the ground floor of the museum, a fishing boat excavated south of Cairo at Dashur will provide them with some crucial data. This boat is similar in terms of its shape and its proportions to Hatshepsut's boats. By deduction, the two researchers will be able to work out the width of their boat, almost five meters. The information being gathered is gradually filling in the holes before a preliminary diagram can be drawn up. You can kind of see on the inside of Using the relics of antiquity, combined with the tools of the 21st century, it is in a modeling laboratory in Florida that the boat will take on concrete form for the first time. The next step is to figure out how to construct the boat based on the remains found at Mirsa Gawazis. There are a lot of difficulties right now because there are literally thousands of decisions to be made. How long is this plank? How wide is this plank? What angle should this shape be? Every plank is unique. We have about 45 planks on each side and they all fit together in an interlocking way. They're not straight edges and that's part of the ancient Egyptian plan for helping the hull to stay integrated, locked together, like a jigsaw puzzle. One of the amazing things, I think in Western minds anyway, is that there's no skeleton to build this boat around. We build the hull plank first. And the planks, the shapes of these planks that I'm working on now actually determines the shape of the hull, not the shape of any frames or molds or anything like that. <laughs> Is it possible to make one? Um, if Queen Hepshepsut's ships got to Pont, it is possible. Um, whether we'll be able to do that uh, is another thing, but uh, I think if you get a competent shipwright, um, they may think it's strange, but uh, it, it's certainly possible to, to work something out like that. It seemed like an impossible mission, but after searching for several weeks, the Egyptian archaeologist Mohammed Abdel Megid found a family of craftsmen whose shipyard on the Nile, an hour outside of Alexandria, is able and willing to take on this ambitious project. Boat building here is a family affair. The oldest worker on the team, Mossad, is without a doubt the most familiar with the traditional techniques. Yosri usually works on fishing boats. Their three brothers, Marouz, Hassan and Hamdi, will soon join them.
That's the initial few strokes of planking. Very nice. Trying Tom. to understand how these all fit together. These two were very easy. This one is easy. These two, very difficult. Yeah. Oh. I think with this model, they have been able to see um, in the three dimensions what is perhaps a little bit confusing in two dimensions. But now they can translate it completely from the drawing to this, and they're going, aha, this is how it works. years after Hatshepsut, the shipbuilders in Rashid are trying to relearn the skills of their ancestors. The archaeologists know that building their boat by recreating and using the ancient techniques will give their experiment greater scientific value. But it is an enormous challenge. The methods of the past have to be reinvented. Every boat that's ever been built begins with laying the keel and the precision with which these shipwrights work with these very simple tools, levers, wedges, strings with the plumb bob. To see this happening here in Egypt, where we have the oldest plank boat, 5,000 years old, is very special for me. What I've really enjoyed about this process is seeing this whole shipyard come together and concentrate on this one piece of work. It's just really quite remarkable. They all know exactly what they're doing. Um, here we go again with the third piece. I mean, it's fantastic, really. Three months have gone by. Temperatures are now reaching 40 degrees Celsius. Things are progressing more slowly. Cheryl and Tom have had to leave, and Mohammed has been put in charge of overseeing the construction process. The Egyptian archaeologist becomes the third pillar in the scientific team. I'm writing a diary. I keep a diary, in fact, for the running of the work. This helped me to remember everything that I do in, at the morning, especially that it is very hot. So it is easy. <laughs> it is better to write now, but because if you return back at your hotel, you will, you will forget everything. Examining the planks discovered at Mirsa Gawazis revealed that the ancient Egyptians did not use nails or metal. They fastened the pieces of wood together through a complex mortise and tenon system that these boat builders are trying to recreate. But as the work progresses, the shape of the planks, which have to be curved along both their length and their width, complicates things for the shipbuilders. The 
the rows of tenons and mortises must be made with greater and even more painstaking precision. The fit has to be perfect because the archaeologists think that the swelling of the wood in the water is the only way to make the ship watertight. The Pharaoh's fleet needed a captain. Hatshepsut chose Nisi, a valiant soldier who had served her father in the past. When he agreed to take on this mission, Nisi knew he was venturing into the unknown. The gods alone would be the masters of his fate. In order to seek their favor, he had several cartouches of divine protection engraved on the stone anchors. And then they've attached it down there. Mm -hmm. And then 35 push, centuries push, later, push, push, David push, Van push, is the captain who has been chosen to follow in Nisi's wake. It, it just, it, it's going to be so tippy, and it, yeah. once it gets rocky... Before he ventures out into the Red Sea, the skipper comes to take a look at his future boat. I've never sailed anything like this. This is the kind of boat they were sailing up to 4,000 years ago. But compared to a boat now, of course, it'll... The technical term would be a pig. We would call it a pig now. You know, it's a, it's a beamy, heavy, you know, short, fat boat that's going to move terribly through the water. What's that? <laughs> I'm a little worried about this. Um, I, I had a, a crack once in a boat, just a little hairline crack. And the title of my book about it is A Mile Down, uh, because that boat sank in 5,000 feet of water, a big 90-foot, very strong steel boat, um, because of a little crack. And these are really big cracks. And I've been reassured by a couple of people that it's OK in wood to have these cracks, that from the drying process, it's normal. I, I don't know. <laughs> months. In just one month, the boat must leave the shipyard and head for the Red Sea. Maruz and the other boat builders put all of their remaining energy into finishing off the boat. كويسه ونفتخر ان احنا عملناها ونزلناها الميه 
في احسن صوره يعني حاجه جميله خالص ما كناش يعني حد يحلم بالموضوع ده A few minutes after the boat is launched, water seeps in through the tiniest cracks in the hull. According to the archaeologists, the wood should absorb the water and start swelling up. They figure that it will take two weeks for the hull to reach maximum expansion and become watertight. The boat has been in the water for two weeks. After 12 hours, all of the water has finally been pumped out of the hull, and Mohammed leaves the boat. Is it watertight now? On a un problème. La, au début, c'était très bien parti. Euh, la construction, les, euh, le choix du chantier, l'efficacité du travail, euh, la durée du travail. Euh, euh, il y avait un rapport euh, qualité et vitesse qui était très, 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 très bien. Mais euh, cela n'empêche pas qu'il y a un problème et il faut trouver une solution. Archaeologists have never found any evidence to show that the Egyptians caulk their boats. So how can they make the boat watertight? and find a solution that will be compatible with the knowledge and skills of the ancient Egyptians. Mohammed and Tom will find the answer to their problem right in the shipyard itself. So this linen fiber. Yeah. I wonder what would happen if we put this between our planks. For hundreds of years, people here have been stuffing plant fiber into the cracks between planks of wood as a method of waterproofing. And in ancient times, other seafaring peoples, such as the Greeks, used beeswax to make their boats watertight. So why not use beeswax? With no other alternative or additional archaeological evidence, this becomes their only option. The boat has now been under construction for 10 months and the final touches are being made. Two rudders are carved out of huge pieces of wood. Cotton sails, each measuring 15 meters in width, are woven. In the streets of Rashid, a dozen men are busy making the rigging. Using strands of hemp fiber, they twist together several kilometers of rope in different thicknesses. Oh, 
I'm really amazed to be at this point, to see this mast up finally. And I just, I mean, we've been waiting, waiting, organizing this, and finally, okay, here it is, the mast is up. Now I'm just anxious to get on with the rest of it. Um, you know, why do we have to break for lunch? <laughs> I want to get the yards on board, sort out this mess of lines, make some order out of it, and, and just get on with it. Before it leaves the shipyard, the boat is christened Min in honor of one of the fertility gods in the Egyptian pantheon. A few days before the expedition was to set off, Hatshepsut had the temple priests create a statue of herself with the god Amun. It would be offered as a token of friendship by the captain of the expedition to the inhabitants of the land of Punt. Hatshepsut's messengers brought her the news that her fleet was ready to sail and that all they were waiting for was her signal. The winds were blowing in the right direction. The pharaoh gave the order for the ships to depart. Construction on the boat began. Min is ready for her maiden voyage. What seemed like an impossible challenge has become reality. The boat in the bas reliefs at Deir el Bari has come back to life 3,500 years after its first expedition. But now that they are out on the open sea, new questions arise. Will the boat be able to weather the gusty winds and withstand the currents and swells of the Red Sea? Or find the route that Hatshepsut's fleet may have taken and reach the land of Punt? I want to just go straight downwind first, uh -huh. see how that is, what the speed is, and then we can change a little, uh -huh. see how the speed is. How much speed? Yeah, just okay. try to learn today. Okay. One of the crew's primary concerns is the rigging. The archaeologists have recreated as faithfully as possible the sail and mast system seen in the Deir al bariba relief. Getting a hang of the ropes, however, seems to be a very tricky affair. When you look at the sail, it looks like we have a lot of lines going and that it's very confusing and complicated. The 16 below and six above, we never change those. They're just stay, they stay in place. So it's actually a much simpler rig than it looks like when you first look at it. We only have four lines to pull up the sail and, and two lines really to control side to side and two others that we don't really use. Uh, but that's it. So it, it's really simple, actually, much simpler than it looks. The boat seems to be going really well right now. We're we surfing on some of these swells down to, you know, at seven, eight knots sometimes, and uh, getting a nice push from behind with the wind. It's going really well.
Min's voyage is like a faraway echo of the journey undertaken by Hatshepsut's boats. Don't go too hard on it. At sundown, Nisi's fleet must have lowered the sails and come back into the shore to rest, get their bearings, and find water. Go hunting, perhaps. Tonight, Min is going to berth in a sheltered bay. As night falls, how can we not think of Hatshepsut sailors? Under the same sky, rocked by the same waves, they were probably nursing the same hopes for their own journey. Clement weather, fair winds, and a calm sea. Uh, most of us didn't sleep at all last night. Min was rocking really wildly, and there was a lot of wind. Uh, and today, there's too much wind to do the full sail. There's about 20 knots of wind, and that's too much for our main sail. So we'll have to take that down and put up just the very small sail. And I think it'll be rougher on the rudders today. I think there'll be bigger waves. Um, so not, not a lucky turn of events for us because we've only had a couple days on this boat, and it'd be nice if the conditions could remain a little lighter. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> Anticipating this sort of situation, David and Cheryl had a second sail made. Its smaller surface should enable them to navigate in strong winds. <laughs> However, the crew is a little apprehensive about going out to sea this morning. Will men be able to withstand today's winds and waves? The success of the project partially depends on her ability to hold up under these types of conditions. They came in sets of two or three and pushed us around quite a bit so that our starboard rail was even with the water and we took some water over the port rail so that was certainly exciting. Oh gosh, you rode the wave really well. I mean, the wall was like a pig, but you'd expect that with this whole ship, really. What I'm really amazed at is I'm not seasick. <laughs> at the end of the day, the cracking sounds at the rear of the boat are the only signs that she's been through some rough sailing conditions. A few waves did throw the ship off balance, but Min was able to reach the spot where they planned to camp. For the crew, this is a first success. We had a few minutes today when we were coming into harbor tonight where it was very tempting and the first mate said to me, he said, you know, we could just put some lights on the ship and take off. He said, we could sail a long way.
The archives of the Kingdom of Egypt contain a papyrus on which it is written that 400 years before Hatshepsut, a steward named Henu went on an expedition to the land of Punt. The pharaoh, her royal steward, Senenmut, and her captain, Nisi, must have known about this journey. Henu's papyrus describes the events of his journey, but does not tell us where the land of Punt is located. <laughs> Studies of the dominant wind and current patterns in the Red Sea show that they travel southward from June to September, making them favorable for departing vessels. Is Punt to be found somewhere in Africa, around what is now Sudan, or in Eritrea? Or is it on the other side of the Red Sea, in Yemen or the Arabian Peninsula? To answer this question, Cheryl and Tom need to know what Min is capable of doing. Can she sail against the wind and thus to the other side of the Red Sea? Or is she only able to sail dead before the wind, forcing her to remain close to the coast? On modern boats, it is the rudder combined with the action of the sail that enables the crew to change direction. For men, the matter is more complicated because of her keel, which is not very deep. It will thus be necessary to find out whether she can change course by filling or flattening the sail and by turning it in different directions in relation to the hull. A new series of experiments gets underway. adjustments, Min is able to do much more than just let herself be pushed along by the wind. She tacks, points her stern towards the open sea, and then back towards the coast. And the fact that the boat continues to move despite variations in the wind shows that the mysterious faraway land of Punt could have been located either in Sudan or in Yemen. Min pursues her journey. The strong wind that was blowing for several days has finally died down, leaving in its place a heavy swell that severely challenges the boat and her crew. But their fears soon vanish, and the journey continues. Day after day, the sailors put men to the test. They reinvent the actions of the ancient seafarers, and the movements of the past come back to them as if they possess the power to go back in time. They were in a world that they knew much better than I know and they had the ability to stop and wait when the winds are up like today, and yet they also knew where they were going, exactly what they would find there, and still, it was a huge journey for them. The chance to repeat one small part of it, even if we can't go all the way to the land of Punt, brings all of us that much closer to really appreciating the ingenuity, the creativity, the intelligence, the skills, the craftsmanship of our ancient predecessors. And it's a very humbling experience. When 
ship suit's fleet returned, the entire population rushed to the shore to see the ships laden with such extraordinary and unknown treasures. There was a dazzling procession of precious woods, rings of gold and electrum, semi-precious gems, ivories, animal hides and ostrich feathers, in addition to live giraffes, panthers and cheetahs. And among these marvels, the most valuable of all were the 31 live myrrh trees and the heaps of fragrant resins that Nisi had brought back from Punt. Hatshepsut now had all that she could wish for. By bringing back the precious incense from Punt, she was able to gain the favors of the priests of Ammon, and this, in turn, would enable her to rule in peace and prosperity for over 20 years. Hatshepsut, whose memory was desecrated, whose name was expunged from the list of pharaohs, would have disappeared forever from the history of Egypt. Could she ever have imagined that 3,500 years after her death, in the 21st century, a group of people would attempt to relive her incredible journey and miraculously raise her out of oblivion.